You're listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. So, it's happened again. It's time to record Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall, and I don't have a guest. I don't. I just have me, my lonesome. And so I'm going to be talking to you today about something that I get really, really excited about. It's called, let's uh, learn how to bust some demons upside the head. How to bust demons upside the head. And I like to do this with what are called spiritual weapons. And I'm going to sit here and break this down uh, piece by piece today so that you understand how to do this, especially because we are now in the month of October. And some of you may notice, like I do, that there's a ramp up of darkness that happens every October leading up to Halloween because it's a big celebration for the powers of darkness and for us on the other side of the battlefield. Um, some of us wind up getting bullied pretty bad during this time of year. And, you know, I I'm tired of believers who have the victory in Jesus Christ being on the losing side of so many things. And God has, you know, equipped me to equip you with knowledge and the tools and skill set to, to not be on the bottom of the devil's shoe as he's taking a stroll through your house to steal your stuff. Now, uh, I do talk a lot, Bride Ministries, about spiritual warfare. As a matter of fact, we have several courses. Even at our Bride Ministries Institute, we, we have a big focus on how to get the job done throughout other podcasts. But, but here, we're going to talk about something that I don't break down very often, which is the specific subject of spiritual weapons. Now, I'm going to ask you this. How many spiritual weapons do you think you have? Think about it. Okay. Uh, many people think that they have one spiritual weapon, the sword, the sword of the spirit. And, and if that was the one thing that you thought of, you know, well, praise God, you know about that, right? But for a lot of people, they think that this is the only thing. And uh, they, they don't really understand the sword of the spirit fully. As a matter of fact, I've, I've seen many preachers teach on the armor of God and come to the conclusion that every component of the armor is defensive. Defensive means that you don't attack anything ever. You just sit back and take whatever comes at you standing. <laughs> so you stand and then you stand therefore. That's, that, that, that's how they teach it often. And um, even the sword you just use to kind of parlay your enemies that are coming at you and you hold your ground. But what if you're holding the little bit, the little tiny corner lot, that the devil left you with of the entire estate God wants you to have. What do you do when everything has been stolen? Do you just keep guarding the little bit, the little cookie crumb, the little tiny of what the devil left you? Or, or do you say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this picture, right? And I started believing that there was something wrong with the picture a long time ago. And I'm glad I did, because that's when you really start seeing God dump revelation that shifts everything, right? And so um, it's called walking in the victory that Jesus Christ has secured for us. It, it doesn't happen automatically. We actually have to learn how to effectively apply what Jesus has done. Now, some people think if God wants you to have it, it's an automatic just because it rhymes doesn't mean it's correct, <laughs> okay? It, 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 it's not true. God wants us to have a lot of things we don't have. Think about this. How many people do you think God wants to have a bad marriage? Unsatisfactory. Raise your hand if you think it's, you know, 50% uh, of us, right? Okay, because 50% of us go through divorce. I'm going to tell you something. God does not want that. He actually wants us all to have Flourishing, robust, enjoyable marriages. That's, I'm just picking one thing. How, how many Christians do you think God wants in debt? Okay, right? But how, how many of us are? So, so there is obvious, clearly, something 
that's not going right. There are all kinds of things that God wants for us, but we don't have it. And it's not because God doesn't want us to have it. It's because of a number of reasons. And one of them may be that the devil has gotten away with stealing some stuff, with trashing your life, with, you know, basically bullying you into a corner, and you have not known what to do about it. I'm going to tell you something. Sometimes a demon needs to get busted upside the head. I wrote a new prayer in honor of this program. I call it the uh, Weapons of Warfare Prayer, which is a, basically a demonstration of how to unleash a slaughter of uh, uh, um, the camp of darkness using spiritual weapons. I'm going to get to that at the end of the program. And of course, if you go to bridemovement.com at the end of this, you'll find that it is there on our prayer resources page ready for you. Um, not that I want you to make a religion out of our prayers, but folks, uh, if you take our prayers as templates and learn how to language your own prayers and learn how to engage with the word of God and the promises of God, the way that we do, my gosh, you're going to start seeing the kind of breakthrough and freedom that Jesus wants you to have in many areas of life. It's, it, it, it's going to be good for you. <laughs> so, Sometimes it feels good to throw a massive bomb in the midst of the camp of the enemy. There's no better way to do this, truly, than, uh, well, to unleash really awesome praise and worship, which can be an, a weapon, but man, you can go into warfare and just loose weapons of warfare, plural, and watch the enemy scatter. I'm going to tell you how to do it. Now, I'm going to say this. It's good to have a list of spiritual weapons on hand for when you are in combat or intercessory mode or simply in tough deliverance sessions that require the enemy to get bullied even after legalities have been addressed. Now, Daniel, qualify yourself. Let's start on the Word of God, okay? Um, Hebrews 4.12 says, For the Word of God is living and active and full of power. This is amplified making it operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword, penetrating as far as the division of the soul and spirit, the completeness of a person, and of both joints and marrow, the deepest parts of our nature, exposing and judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart. Now, we know that this passage is comparing the Word of God to a two-edged sword, okay? It's alive, and it's full of power. Now, this means so many things, and I, I, I mean, I teach out of this verse a lot because I use this verse to talk about the difference between soul and spirit and how the word of God judges between them. Um, how the word of God has an impact and is designed to impact us, spirit, soul, body, and heart, every component of our person. And um, it, this verse is so beautiful because it's all in one easy to reference place. But here's the truth. The word of God is a sword. It's a sword. And here in Ephesians 6, 17, when Paul is talking about the armor of God, he says, let us take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay. Now, I made a comment. I said, many people have taught the sword of the spirit as a defensive weapon. And they say, you know, you just stand there, you take the blows of the enemy and um, eventually you get to die and go to heaven. So you'll be fine. Right. Well, what if God has more for your life than to take a series of beatings from the enemy? I have a thought. What if God doesn't want his children to get bullied? What good parent do you know enjoys sending their kid off to elementary school to get bullied? Hmm? That, that's not what good, you know, um, that's not something that gives parents pride and joy. Yet we think that we have a great and glorious father in heaven who just basically dumped us onto this earth to get bullied <laughs> and said, you know, no, don't fight back, just take it. Like, well, there is a balance on some of these things, right? We do love our enemies and we do bless those that curse us. And there are other passages in the Bible that deal with things like that. But I'll tell you, when we are dealing with agents of darkness that are pure evil entities, we're not dealing with humans in need of redemption. We are definitely at war. And it's not a war that we are supposed to be nice about. And even when we're dealing with human agents out of body, sometimes 
there is a call for uh, uh, <laughs> the use of strong force, okay? Um, and, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Now, let, let me say this. Uh, when it comes to the sword of the spirit, okay, we are told that it is the word of God, but this word, this translated sword in Hebrews 4.12 and Ephesians 6.17 is the Greek word makaira. Now, uh, historically, the makaira was understood as, as a large knife, okay, with a curved cutting edge. Some have one edge and some have two. And of course, in Hebrews 4.12, the word of God as a makaira has two edges. All right. Um, this is interesting. And this, and this is one of the reasons why people have argued, look, this sword is for defensive purposes, primarily because it, it's not a very big sword. And the Makaira historically was not a very big sword. As a matter of fact, when I figured this out, I was kind of disappointed. I was like, dang, Jesus. I mean, this is rough down here. It, there, there, there are thorns and thistles and religious people. I mean, it's scary. This is a scary place, you know. Uh, I mean, I don't know who I'm more scared of, the religious people or the Satanists, because both of them are bringing death. <laughs> Man. Well, anyway. Um, there's another type of sword referenced in the New Testament, and it's called the Romphea, okay? That, that is a sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus in the book of Revelation when he's destroying everything. And this was a long and broad cutlass. Its handle could be over a foot and a half alone, right? So it's like the whole Makaira is the length of the handle of the other sword. And then uh, this weapon would then on top of that be two to three feet long. So it's a really big weapon, you know? And it caused the only documented change to Roman armor by a new weapon. So people used the Romphea to basically hack their enemies to pieces. You didn't have that kind of liberty with a Makaira because it's smaller. So Jesus gets the Romphea, we get the Makaira. <laughs> and I struggle with that. I'm like, man, you know, it's rough. Why can't we get the Rome fail? You know, and then this got even more confusing because as I got into the spirit realm and began to see things and understand things and get pictures and get reports, you know, I, I began to realize that we carry swords that can be different sizes and lengths and intensities. It's, it's, it's very interesting. So you actually can have a pretty big sword that your spirit man carries. Uh, but when we look at it from the perspective of the word of God, we're dealing with a Makaira. Now, God broke this down to me, for my understanding, in a way that unlocked something for me. And I'm going to tell you what he did. He pointed out that all weapons are lethal. And he told me about Jackie Chan. He said, you know, well, he didn't. I'm kind of playing around with this conversation here. But, you know, he's like, look at Jackie Chan, right? What weapon is this guy not lethal with? He'll take you out with a hairbrush, a comb, a stapler, a chair, a table, a sword, a staff. <laughs> you know, it's like, dang, the guy's lethal. Any weapon can be lethal and very effective in the hands of a skilled warrior. That's the lesson, right? So, so the Makaira can actually be a very, very effective weapon. But the difference between something like a fully automatic shotgun and a pistol, for instance, is that a pistol may require better aim. <laughs> a more skilled tactitioner, right? You, you need to practice shooting to use a pistol, whereas with a you know massive shotgun, maybe a sawed off, I mean, you just point it in a general direction, it's going to spray some stuff and something's gonna land, <laughs> you know? Um, it, hunting with a rifle and a shotgun are two different experiences. So, 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 so we have this thing with the Makaira where it, it is a weapon, it is sharp. It is part of what we are equipped with, but 
What many people have not understood is that in the use of the makaira, it requires skillful application. Well, skillful application of what? If the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, then skillful application of the makaira is skillful application of the Word of God. In other words, I can't just not read the Bible, go into prayer, and think I'm going to be a force to be reckoned with. Because I'm really good at saying, Lord, help me. I don't know what to do. They're hurting me so bad. Please intervene. Please, please, please. Right? Because that's not actually using the sword. That's begging for help. <laughs> but, you know, one of the the interesting things about being an heir of God and a co-heir with Christ is that you are operating from a place of identity that entitles you to certain things in his kingdom. <laughs> and many of us don't realize what the identity change secured for us by Jesus Christ means. You know, and, 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 and here's where the Bible gets very interesting, right? The Bible says that the Sort of the spirit is the word of God. So when we go into prayer, what we need to realize is that the word of God was designed to be a weapon in our mouths. And when we begin to use the word of God as a weapon in our mouths, we have to realize that the word of God, especially the Logos word, it's written, um, has a lot to say. It has a lot to say. And so there's a lot to learn. There's a lot of facets of applying the word of God as a weapon. And if the only way we have learned to read the Bible is as a moral code or something to pick us up when we're feeling down, we've missed a big, big key. Okay. So today I'm taking this key and I'm giving it to you. And I'm going to tell you that learning how to skillfully apply the word of God is going to allow you to shift and upgrade your spiritual competency when it comes to the subject of warfare. What many people have not realized is that there are weapons all over the word of God. You need to realize that you should be using your life to engage with demons like their target practice. <laughs> Bust some demons upside the head. When we look at Proverbs 18.21, it says that life and death is in the power of the tongue, and those that love it shall eat of its fruit. Right? Life and death. That means that you can use your mouth to speak life to things that are of God, and you can use your mouth to speak death to things that are in opposition to God, like the works of darkness to sabotage and destroy your life and your family and your finances and everything else that you hold valuable and dear. <laughs> it's a different way to think than, wait a minute, I'm supposed to stand on the cookie crumb of my inheritance that the devil left me with after he got done raiding my whole house. God is not in the business of assigning his children to a permanent posture of being the bullied little kid, you know? Some of us have gotten bullied all their lives, so you're upset at me now because I'm rubbing you the wrong way. Good. <laughs> Maybe this will inspire a rethinking of your life engagement strategy. I'm trying to help you. Now, there are weapons all over the word of God, and I'm gonna prove that to you in a minute, but I wanna point something out. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse four and five. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For the pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Now, there's a lot of really great Christian teaching on taking your thoughts captive, right? Because when you have really bad thoughts, thoughts of causing others uh, pain, cause of sabotaging things, cause, thoughts of cheating, thoughts of lying, you know, so on and so forth. We're supposed to take those captive and not act on those thoughts so that we can find ourselves in a seat and in the posture of obedience to Christ. But many of us actually ignore 
the first part of this, verse 4, which says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Now, I want to point something out, okay? The word weapons in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, is plural. It's plural word. Weapons is not singular. It's not, for the weapon of our warfare is not carnal, that being the sword of the Spirit. It's the weapons of our warfare, which is plural. Now, these weapons do all kinds of things. They, they do pull down strongholds. They cast down arguments and high things. Now, high things are not limited to our thoughts. They can actually be high things in the spirit realm that are in opposition to God and working against the um, flourishing of the knowledge of God throughout the earth. And God has an agenda for his glory to sweep the earth. As a matter of fact, it does say, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord shall cover the earth as the water cover the sea. I guarantee you there are high things that stand in opposition to that. And so what do we do? We sit down, be quiet, and ask for help. No, no. You engage. The weapons of our warfare are found throughout the word of God. And when we find weapons of warfare in the word of God, we are able to strategically apply them with our mouth, thus loosing those weapons as a sword out of our mouths. So the sword actually opens up to us, because the sword is the word of God, a whole plethora of weapons that are plural, and they are found throughout the word of God. And as we begin to look at these and engage with them, I promise you, you are going to enjoy watching the powers of darkness cringe every time you get down to pray. They're going to start hating you and not laughing at you. Wouldn't that be cool for a change, you know? So... Um, we're going to talk about 25, <laughs> 25 weapons. And I'll tell you, I'm just scratching the surface because for all 25 weapons, I'm going to tell you that you have access to, there are more. And I'm going to tell you, there is the logos word and the rhema word, right? The logos word is the written word of God. The rhema word is the spoken word of God. It, it's what God is saying, right? And so you know, you can prophesy the Logos word of God and declare what has been written in the Bible as God's prophetic word for right now. Or you can prophesy the rhema word of God, which is what God is speaking right now, which may not actually be written down word for word verbatim in the Bible, but will always be backed up by what the Bible says. Now, if God has both the Logos word and a rhema word, I promise you, he has both Logos weapons and rhema weapons. In other words, he can display and, and, and give revelation on weaponry and warfare strategies that you can use that go beyond what is written in the word of God. And I'm going to give you 25 weapons written in the word of God that are just scratching the surface of the total number of weapons found in the word of God. What am I saying? I'm saying you have no idea what they have in the war rooms of heaven and who's using these things. Me. <laughs> Hopefully you too, soon enough. We're going to start <clears throat> with a weapon I love uh, dearly. It's called the spear of the Lord, right? There, there is a weapon, okay, called the spear, and it is a spear. It says in Psalm 35, verse 3, draw out also the spear and javelin and close up the way of those who pursue and persecute me. Say to me, I am your deliverance. The Bible says, The Lord said to Joshua, Stretch out the spear that is in your hand towards Ai, for I will give it into your hand. And Joshua stretched out the spear that was in his hand towards the city. Right? He, in the case of Joshua, he used the spear as a prophetic act. De declaring with God through that prophetic act the victory of Israel against their enemies. But God in Psalm 35 verse 3 actually says, draw out also the spear and javelin and close it away. Now, we read passages like that and we think, oh, yeah, you know, that's, that's just something that they did back there because that would have zero application to us. That's clearly why God left it in the Bible because it means nothing for us. We just read right over that and feel good about it. No, okay. no, 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 bad Christian. 
The spear and the javelin, clearly referenced in Psalm 35, verse 3, have spiritual ramifications, okay? And I want to suggest something, right? We have been way too mm, mm, limited in our capacity to draw revelation from the Word of God, uh, for some of us. Some of us have just said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to uh, fit this into a framework that makes sense with Western thinking. Well, what about Eastern thinking? <laughs> What about the thinking of the people that actually wrote this stuff? You know, I'm going to fit everything I read in the Word of God into my understanding of the 3D world. Well, what about the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, and eleventh dimensions? What does the Word of God mean in those realms? There is so much more beyond the 3D realm of surface Earth, and I have to say surface Earth because there's a hollow Earth. Um, there is so much more beyond that, and yet we limit what we understand the Word of God to be speaking to, to to what we have seen with our physical eyes i tell you the moment that you begin to see things with your spiritual eyes there is a cataclysmic shift in understanding of the world in which we occupy moreover what is clear is that these weapons that are clearly articulated in the word of god can be spoken and they form they take on form and substance in the spirit realm and so you can speak a, a spear and say, I release a spear of the Lord into the camp of the enemy. <laughs> and as you say these words, it's the spear. It, it takes form. It may be extracted from a heavenly armament or war room and loosed. <laughs> it's like, whoa, this is real. And if you're a friend with seers, you have a lot of fun because the, the seers will see everything that you're saying and then they'll be like, whoa, you know, when you said this, this is what happened when you saw that, I saw it, man. And um, if, if that sounds really strange to you, I recommend that you go back and listen to some of our other podcasts. Uh, one that's really good for this and, and, and getting a good grip on it is our series with Casey, where she talked about some of her sessions with me and how we dealt with things and how she was able to see into the spirit all of the different weaponry and strategies we were using to take out darkness in other words you know let's get a grip on what it means to bust some demons upside the head like this is not just allegorical language it's not metaphor we need to begin to learn how to use the bible as a weapons cache <laughs> um okay number two arrows Psalm 18, 14, it says, Yea, he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He shot out lightnings and discomfited them. Wow, God has arrows. Did you know that the fiery darts of the wicked one are simple counterfeits to heavenly arrows? <laughs> and it takes right, us, right us into number three right? Because in this one passage, Psalm 18, 14, we not only have arrows, we have lightning. Did you know that God has lightning? That's no surprise because God is light and he can emit lightning. And let me tell you something, when lightning storms of God strike encampments of demons in the spirit realm, it's electrifying. <laughs> so, 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 as we get into this, I, I, what I want to do is I want to birth something in your mind, a concept, an idea. That your mouth is the enemy's worst nightmare. So instead of cussing out your kids, cussing out your wife, and cursing your own success by saying, I'm no good at anything, you can reapply this instrument of great life or destruction that God has given us to bring blessings upon everything under your stewardship and to bring absolute desolation to the works of darkness with powerful weapons. Psalm 1813, if you just rewind one verse from where we were in Psalm 1814, we find two more weapons. It says, the Lord also thundered in the heavens and the highest gave his voice hailstones, and coals of fire. Whoa! God has hailstones. Now, 
hailstones cause property damage. If you want to damage the property of the enemy, man, release a storm of hail. Speak it. Call for it. See, it may not transact into the physical realm that physical hail begins to come down upon, you know, uh, some kind of evil place. But what we're doing is transacting shifts in environment in the spirit realm, which will have direct correlation to what takes place in the natural. You need to realize that if, you know, especially if you haven't seen it this way yet, you are engaging two worlds at once. You are engaging a physical world, but you are also engaging a spiritual world. And kingdom living is a lifestyle of balance where you effectively engage on both sides of the veil. Walking between realms. That's true kingdom living. Walking between realms with the glorious victory of Jesus Christ. And in order to effectively navigate the other side of the realm, the other side of the veil, it's helpful to use weapons to clear out those things that the enemy is setting up, that doing this, this nonsense. Bowls of fire, you know. Man, have you ever been hit with a coal of fire? I hope not. It's not pleasant. So throw it at the demons, man. You know, you can bust demons upside the head with this stuff. I've given you five. We have 20 more. And then I'm going to end this podcast with a prayer. Locusts. This one's really cool. The Bible says, else if, and, and this is Exodus chapter 10, verse 4, else if thou refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring the locusts into the, thy coast. And so later on, the Lord says to Moses, stretch on thy hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come up upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land and every, and even all that the hail has left, right? And Moses stretched forth his rod over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested upon the coast of Egypt. Very grievous were they. Before them, there were no such locusts as they, neither after them shall be such. Where do you think those locusts came from? They came from the spirit realm. God had them and he released them as a plague from the spirit into the natural. And they were brought in by, and here's a bonus, okay? I, I said I was going to give you 25, but I, I can't help myself. I'm going to give you 26. The east wind of judgment that came upon the land of Egypt. That's something that is a weapon of warfare. But the locusts, they devour things that have been planted. And you know what the enemy plants? The enemy plants curses and evil words against the children of God. Satanists pray against churches and pastors and Christians in their city, Christian businesses. They do rituals and incantations to shut things down. Uh, there are people that actually pay um, uh, individuals to do witchcraft intentionally against uh, those that, that are causing them a problem or a headache. We have no idea sometimes how much we are up against. I, I mean, Santeria is a real thing. They're like hitmen in the spirit <laughs> with their witches' pots and their initiations and so forth. Look, um, as they do this, right, they, they do their interviews, they're, they're literally seeding words. And those words go into a type of field in the spirit. And they grow a harvest against our lives, against our businesses, against our families, against our communities and churches. Believers. The locusts of God devour the fields that the enemy has seeded, meaning for all of their work, all of their labor, all of their evil curses and so forth that they are seeding. The locusts of God will come and eat it up. And for all of their sacrifices and things that they did, it'll actually bankrupt them. They, they won't have anything that will manifest against us. So, so the locusts are a very powerful way to shut down what the enemy is mounting against you. I love the locusts of God. I lose them all the time. It's amazing. Engines of war. 
Ezekiel 26, verse 9. It says, And he shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down thy towers. Okay, enemy set up a fortress, sat on something that belongs to you. It's time to set engines of war against the walls of the enemy. Just speak it. Angels will take these things and plant them against the walls of the enemy, and the engines of war will begin to engage. This is spiritual warfare. This is busting demons upside the head. Man, this is a pep talk. Get ready to win. Yeah. You know, uh, it's about time because I know that God is tired of watching his people lose. Number eight. Actually, number nine, but number eight. Okay, ignoring the bonus. The hook of the Lord. Well, this one's good. Second Kings 19.28. Because thy rage against me and thy tumult is come into mine ears, therefore I will put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way which thou came. Uh, Ezekiel 29, verse 4. But I will put hooks in thy jaws, and I will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales, and I will bring thee up out of the midst of thy waters and all of the fish of thy river shall stick to thy scales. See, uh, God uses the hook of the Lord to deal with sea serpents. And I love, especially when I'm contending with Python or Leviathan, or you know, one of these guys, Kundalini. Oh man, I, I just take those hooks. They go right in. As a matter of fact, I found that you can take hooks and charge them. With the names of God, I, I'm going to leave the names of God out of this for now, but there are so many creative things that you can do with the hooks. And when they go in, actually, you know, you can have angels put them in the flesh of the spirits in the spirit realm and pull on them and pull them out of environments and even people. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm in the middle of deliverance and stuff, I'll say, angels, Put in the hooks, you know, and, and the hooks go in the uh, demon or the principality or whatever it is, and then, then it's brutal. <laughs> so, so we love the hook of the Lord. You, you could use the hook to go fishing, you know. I, I, I'm telling you, it's about time that we learned what is available to us. The net, okay, you got the hook which is really good, especially against water spirit and marine spirit stuff. You got the net as well. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 13, my net also will I spread upon him and he shall be taken into my snare and I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet shall he not see it, though he shall die there. Um, the Bible says in Ezekiel 17, verse 20, And I will spread my net upon him, and he shall be in my snare, and I will bring him to Babylon, and will plead with him there for his trespass, that he has trespassed against me. See, God, God can use a net to bring something from somewhere, somewhere else. And, you know, I, I use nets for all kinds of things. I mean, sometimes if demons try to run from a battlefield, and I don't believe they've been sufficiently punished, and they're trying to use some kind of escape route or back door, wormhole. I will loose a net and snare them in it and bring them back into a place for more punishment because I'm having a good day. You need to learn who you are in the kingdom. We have just been a little deceived. Now, uh, the net is very, very effective. You know, um, it, it, when I'm in session sometimes with people, the enemy will uh, try to, and, and this is very interesting because I work with a lot of people that have dissociation and parts. Sometimes I will have a fragment of a person's soul presenting at a surface talking to me, and all of a sudden they'll be gone like that. What's happened? In the spirit realm, a demon has grabbed them, put their hand over their mouth, literally, and tried to run them into another dimension so that they can't get the healing and the help that they need from Jesus. Do I tolerate that? No way. I loose a net 
in the spirit. And I say, I'm bringing them right back to the serpents. And you know what? Boom, they're back. And I put a sword through the demon. And I may confine it to Dan's box of fun. Because when I get Dan's box of fun, I put all kinds of fun things in there. You know, I'll put an engine of war. And I'll put hailstones and lightning and arrows and shake up the box with the demons inside. It's a lot of fun, but they don't like it. Um, you can be creative. God is a creative God, and we have been created in his image. God actually has set it up. So once we understand the power of the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and the weapons of our warfare, we can engage in creative warfare against the enemy that will leave him, that will leave them absolutely decimated. It's, it's, it's really cool. I, I don't know if you can see, I'm kind of excited about this. It really gets me jazzed. Uh, the hiss of the Lord, Isaiah 7, 18. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall hiss for the fly that is in the uttermost parts of the rivers of Egypt and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria. So, so this, is, this is pestilence and plague and, and discomfort, right? And the hiss of the Lord will bring that in. You know, you do not want the God most high, the king of creation, hissing at you. But he will hiss at his enemies, according to Isaiah 7, 18. And it brings things in. You can call for that. <laughs> in prayer, the instrument of death. <laughs> Psalm 7, 13. He hath also prepared for him the instruments of death. He ordaineth his arrows against the persecutors. Come on. I loose instruments of death upon the powers of darkness. And I, I, I'll tell you, you know, it's very interesting because we find that we are dealing with a lot of very creative stuff as of late. We're dealing with synthetic entities. We're dealing with holographic entities. We're dealing with composite entities. We're dealing with hybrid entities. We're dealing with all kinds of concoctions of things, clones of soul parts that, that are not actual, like they're, they're not real human substance. They're simply clones, maybe, um, you know, with a small modicum of DNA that, is otherwise, you know, not human at all. It's the, these clones running around in the spirit. I mean, we run into so much stuff. And what we realize is that there's a lot of things that are running around in the spirit that the enemy has built, developed, or designed through technological and scientific processes that has no right to exist. Now, for that reason, things can be destroyed. There are a lot of things that the enemy is using to harass people that can actually be completely destroyed. And I didn't know that at first. This came, this, this understanding came later for me. But we see stuff get destroyed on a regular basis. Uh, so I, I know it's true. I'm just telling you. Um, not everything is a fallen angel. And so, you know, while the fallen angels don't necessarily get destroyed because they are spirits whose origin is with God, that is not true of everything in the kingdom of darkness at all. And there are instruments of death that will bring death to entities that do not have ordained existence from God. <laughs> so you use them. Man, the bees of the Lord, okay? Isaiah seven eighteen. Yeah, yeah, you can lose bees in the spirit realm. And they sting and it hurts. Confusion. Psalm 35, verse 26. Let them be ashamed and brought to confusion together that rejoice at mine hurt. Let them be clothed with shame and dishonor that magnify themselves against me. Okay. Uh, all right. Um, <laughs> confusion is something that can be released into the midst of the camp of the powers of darkness. And they will get confused. Make no mistakes about it. This is a real way to deal damage to what the enemy is doing. And you can lose confusion on different levels. I mean, uh, confusion on national and international levels can be executed in high-level warfare that breaks down the synchronization of efforts being coordinated by the powers of darkness. You can also lose confusion into local covens and witchcraft cults. I mean, it's, it's amazing 
uh, what can be done here. And, and um, hmm, it is a blessing when confusion strikes those that are trying to do more evil with the time they have on this earth. Uh, Psalm 35 verse 4 says, Let them be confounded and put to shame that seek after my soul. Let them be turned back and brought to confusion that devise my hurt. Did you know that this is a valid prayer? Okay. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of people uh, uh, shy away from using the book of Psalms as a source of prayer notes um, and, and have opted to uh, have a very, very otherwise a weak and um, limp prayer life with very little defensive structure and retaliatory consequences for those that are coming against them. Okay. Um, it's time that we learn to stand up to our bullies. Confusion, you can use it. Battering ram. Ezekiel chapter four, verse two says, and lay siege against it and build a fort against it and cast a mount against it. Set the camp also against it and set battering rams against it round about. All right. Now, if you've noticed, and you, if you're really smart, what you're going to realize is that there are more bonuses in these passages I'm reading. I'll say, you know, there's one weapon here, but you're like, wait, you just listed three weapons there, Dan Duvall, in that one passage. And the answer's like, yeah. Yeah, did you catch it? <laughs> um, I'm going to rewind just for a second back to Psalm 35, verse 26. <laughs> You can speak the clothing of shame and dishonor upon the powers of darkness. <laughs> oh, it's a costume party. All right, <clears throat> just in time for Halloween. The battering ram. Ezekiel 21, verse 22. At his right hand was the divination for Jerusalem to appoint captain, to open the mouth in the slaughter, to lift up the voice with shouting, to appoint battering rams against the gates, to cast them out, and to build a fort, okay? Battering rams. Engines of war and battering rams are a dynamic duo. Dynamic. All right, fiery stream. I love this. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. God, our God is fiery God. He is a God of fire. As a matter of fact, our spirits, which are light from light, are also fire from his fire. And fire proceeds forth from him. And the fiery stream can be released into the camp of darkness. As a matter of fact, the fiery stream can be released as a wall to guard us. God said, I am Jehovah Shammah. I'll be a wall of fire round about. Fiery stream is a weapon. I love to give angels flamethrowers. As a matter of fact, sometimes when I'm working with people and um, we're dealing with demonic structures within and around the person's life and they have parts that really want to take part in what God is doing to set the person free, I'll have the angels give human soul fragments flamethrowers that blow flames of spiritual fire of Jesus Christ. And they will run around and torch demons. And we watch it happen and laugh about it. This is real stuff. Um, the cage or box. Oh, my gosh. I, you know, the, there is something very significant about boxes in the spirit realm. And the Bible will call them cages. So the Bible says in Jeremiah 5.27, as a cage is full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they are become great and wax rich. So you, you, you could put birds in a cage. Revelation 18, 12 says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon, the greatest fallen is fallen and has become a habitation of devils in the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. You know, uh, a cage will contain things, but cages aren't limited to habitations for birds. They have a wide application throughout the spirit realm. Anything can be put in a cage. And one of the things that we see in the Bible is that our soul is escaped out of the snare of the fowler. In other words, human souls can be uh, snared into a cage of the enemy. How much more can the enemy be snared into the cages of the Lord God Most High? So, um, I'm, I mean, using boxes and cages, we do all kinds of messed up stuff to the powers of darkness. I, I, I mean, it's a lot of fun. 
So uh, you have Kate, number 17 of the actual list. Ammon, woe. Ezekiel 5.16, when I shall send upon them the evil arrows of famine, which shall be for their destruction, and which I will send to destroy you, and I will increase the famine upon you, and will break your staff of bread. Hmm. Um, God can send famine. That happens in the natural, but it can happen in the spirit. It can happen in the spirit. And I am telling you about spiritual weapons. If you speak of famine against the encampment of darkness, it doesn't mean that a famine is going to hit the natural realm. It means that a famine is going to hit the dimension of interface where the kingdom of darkness is operating from. And it's going to hurt. Deep sleep. Huh. Isaiah 29 verse 10, For the Lord has poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers has he covered deep sleep. You know, you can put the enemy to sleep through deep sleep and say, you know, I, I command a deep sleep upon a camp of the enemy. It, you know, have you ever been at work? You're sitting there and you're just like, I'm so tired. Oh my God. I'm so tired. Here's a coffee. But, but you can't get to the coffee machine. Bob got the coffee first. Coffee's out. Oh my God. I can't do this. I can't. I can't. Do this. Right? You're in trouble. Deep sleep can overtake you in the natural, but I guarantee you, it can overtake the enemy in the spirit. Can you imagine a demon trying to persecute you and your family? It's got a, a, an assignment to put strife in your home, right? So you come home and that demon's ready. He's like, I'm going to strike with strife. And he, but, but, but you hit him with deep sleep and he's like, oh, I'm ready. Oh my gosh, I'm so tired. Oh my gosh. Oh, I can't do it. I can't make strife. I'm too tired. You know, they pass out. This is real. We don't see it with our physical eyes, but I'm telling you, weapons of warfare are real. Deep sleep can be applied to all kinds of things in the spirit realm. And uh, they can be applied to portals, and wormholes, and stargates. You can put those to sleep as well. You can, I mean, um, it ends functional capacity for things. Very, very good weapon. Hammer of God. Jeremiah 23, verse 29. Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Hammer. Bang. So, 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 so you lose. I mean, think about hitting someone with a hammer. Enough said. The furnace. I, I use the furnace all the time. I love the furnace. The Bible says in Ezekiel chapter twenty-two, verse twenty-three, as silver is melted in the midst of the furnace so shall you be melted in the midst thereof. And you shall know that I, the Lord, have poured out my fury upon you. Now, I put demons in a furnace of fire all the time and barbecue their butt. This is all about how to bust demons upside the head. You need to know this because it's available to you in the Word. You, I mean, I mean you don't need me to tell you this if you just, well, we're reading the Word and we're able to come to, you know, this conclusion yourself is all there but we've been trained not to see it it's kind of heartbreaking can you imagine if the church knew about this and engaged the powers of darkness like this for the past 2,000 years maybe just maybe the Illuminati would not be determining everything that happens at the top level of politics which I will tell you right now God is challenging in a very head-on way not just in some countries, this is worldwide at this point. There is something massive shifting. But just imagine if for 2,000 years, Christians engaged with this, instead of, you know, 1,000 years of saying Hail Marys. Please don't get me started, okay? You're getting me fired up. You, yeah, you. It's your fault. Stars. <clears throat> We didn't know that stars could be employed in warfare. However, the Bible says in Judges 5.20, they fought from the heavens. The stars from their courses, courses fought against Sisera, the enemy of the people of God. This is part of Deborah's song in uh, Judges chapter 5. Deborah, the judge of Israel, wrote a song talked about what happened in that battle with Sisera. She said they fought from the heavens. This was a multidimensional war here. 
Did you know that the stars have a first estate and their first estate is to bring praises and glory to the Lord God, most high creator and maker of heaven and earth. And they have been perverted from their first estate by the work of darkness, evil rituals, pulling them out of their courses and empowering uh, evil agendas through them. It's time to flip tables, restore these things to their first estate and employ them in the advancement of the kingdom of God in the earth. You can do that in prayer. Stars are a mighty weapon of warfare. And if you have the book, Prayers that Shake Heaven and Earth, you will notice that in the um, morning prayer, there's actually an engagement, an intentional engagement of the stars at the outset of this day to repurpose them to serve the agendas of the kingdom of God. Powerful, powerful stuff. The razor of the Lord, Isaiah 7 verse 20 says, in the same day, the Lord will shave with the hired razor. Whoa. With those from beyond the river, with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair of the legs, and will also remove the beard. When I find bearded entities, I love to shame them with the razor of the Lord. Cut it off. I also like to put the razor of the Lord in um, my box of fun with the demons that get shaken up inside of it because they're sharp. Um, <clears throat> the fear of day and the fear of the night. Now, this is a very interesting weapon. You know, uh, the, the, the powers of darkness think they have you running in fear. But I guarantee you, as you step into a full expression of your identity in Christ Jesus, you learn how to pray a different way. They're going to be the ones in fear. And if you structure things properly, you will see that they are in fear of all that the Lord is bringing to them. These are the powers of darkness day and night. They don't get a break. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 28, verse 66, your life shall hang in doubt before you. You shall fear day and night and have no assurance of life. <laughs> okay. Now, of course, this was being applied um, to Israel in its original saying, but the principle of applying the fear in the, day to, in the fear of the night is something that God can do to anyone, um, including the powers of darkness. So we just extract the weapon. Dry wind, Jeremiah 4, verse 11. This is so good when dealing with water spirits. It says in Jeremiah 4.11, at that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a dry wind of the desolate heights blows in the wilderness towards the daughter of my people, not to fan or to cleanse. See, God has a dry wind and man, does this cause terrible pain and anxiety to uh, marine spirits that get trapped outside of a realm of evil spiritual water. One of the things I love to do is dry up the enemy's waters and then send a dry wind and lock them in a pocket realm with it and call it a dry place. <laughs> Whoa. All right. <clears throat> Last one. I know. I know. You're tired. Dan Duvall, we're tired of you. You, you got to wrap this up. I get it. Rod of iron. Now, this one's so interesting because Jesus has a rod of iron. And with it, he will dash the nations to pieces. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verse 26 through 27, it says, And he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father. And in our union with Christ, the overcomers, those that qualify as this, which it, as well, I understand it isn't everybody, <laughs> but there's a place where we arrive at that, um, gain access to the rod of iron. But Jesus always has the rod of iron. And Jesus can always wallop a demon upside the head with his rod of iron. As a matter of fact, a lot of our prayers, especially for deliverance, um, have, have, have a clause where we call for the deeding over of territory in a person's life that was ordered over by the powers of darkness and say, rule over it, Lord Jesus, with your rod of iron. So these are 25. But I'm here to tell you that all 25 of these, they're one, found in the word of God, meaning that when you quote the word of God in prayer, you are releasing these weapons 
as a sword against your enemies. The powers of darkness and evil spirits that are hunting you down and destroying your life. And I find that sometimes we just need to do a bit of clearing. You know, it's like things are getting intense, enemies encroaching over here, enemies encroaching over there. It's like, ah, it's coming at me from every angle. I don't even know what to pray about anymore. Sometimes, you know, when I get in, you know, they start feeling that the encroachment atmosphere. I release a prayer of spiritual weapons that just blows everything up. <laughs> and what I do to do that is I employ weapons of warfare. Are you ready? Okay, here's the example. Now you'll be able to get this prayer at bridemovement.com. So um, I, don't worry about trying to scribe it and put it on someone else's blog. Like we'll, we'll have it on our website. I call this the weapons of warfare prayer. Father in heaven, I come before you in the mighty name. Father in heaven, I come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. I praise you for your power and great glory. I declare that your name is Jehovah Gabor. The Lord who is mighty in battle. You are Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts. I suit up with the armor of God, the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. My feet, they are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I take up the shield of faith, which quenches every fiery dart of the wicked one and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I also take up the garments of vengeance and the cloak of zeal. I surround myself with the smoke screen, acting as a sight and sound barrier against satanic agents, interlopers, and evil spirits. I identify the evil spirits and satanic agents that have taken up assignments against my home, family, business, and economy. I speak that the weapons of my warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to the tearing down of strongholds, the casting down of arguments and of every high thing which exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ. There are more with us than there are with them, and I declare that your angels hearken unto the voice of your word. Therefore, I arm your angelic armies with your word and lose carnage against the enemy that has surrounded me, persecuted me, opposed me, and resisted me. I release arrows, lightnings, hailstones, and coals of fire. I scattered the enemies that have scattered themselves against me with famine and devouring storms. I engage the spirits that have assembled from underwater locations and speak famine. I speak that they are trapped in prisons assembled round about them, locking them into pocket realms characterized by dry wind. I call for the drying up of the enemy's waters. I release engines of war, instruments of war, and instruments of death upon the agents and devices of darkness in the name of Jesus. I choose to tread upon serpents and scorpions. The evil agents must be smited by the rod of iron. I loose the battle axe of God into the encampments of darkness and target obstacles at their roots. The choirs and harmonies of darkness will suffer at the release of the blast of God and the rebuke from the voice of the Most High. I am a son of God and ambassador of heaven. I was not put here to suffer bullying at the hands of a defeated kingdom. I spite my enemies and exalt the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, at whose name every name must bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. I set fire to the enemy's strategies with a fiery stream of God. I plant snares and traps on every evil assignment against my life, calling them booby traps. Ravenous birds devour wondrously in the encampments of darkness. Locusts devour the evil words and curses spoken against me, my house, destiny, business, ministry, and everything under my stewardship. I engage with the heavenly bodies and employ the stars, declaring that just as the stars fought from their courses against Sisera, so the stars are deployed in agendas to advance the kingdom of God in heaven and on the earth. I am more than a conqueror in Christ. I declare that as I move out of fear, for perfect love casts out all fear, fear of the day and fear of the night is overtaking the governments of evil in the spirit realm. Tempest, strike the evil powers and do not relent. Deep sleep, overtake the enemies that are fleeing, impaling them in their efforts to escape such that they feel the full impact of their rebuke. I declare portals, wormholes, and escape routes are shut down in every realm, age, timeline, dimension, frequency, and vibration, past, present, and future to infinity. May the war horses of heaven tread down those that rise up against the name of Jesus Christ and the power of his might. I declare a massive clearing in the spiritual atmosphere and environment of my life and those connected to me, and thank you, God most high that you came to punish the hosts of the high ones that are on high and the kings of the earth. Amen. There you have it. Now it's yours. God bless and Godspeed. You've been listening to Discovering the Truth with Dan Duvall. If you would like to connect with us at Bride Ministries, or to support what we are doing financially, visit us at www.bridemovement.com.